Today we're going to hear from uh, each of our guest writers about books and writers that have inspired them. Uh, which works do they consider great or important and why? Christos Cholkas, novelist and playwright. Christos was born in Melbourne. His first novel was Loaded and was published in 1995. And he later, it was later made into the controversial and award-winning film Head On. His second novel was The Jesus Man. He's written several plays, including Who's Afraid of the Working Class and Dead Caucasians. His latest novel is a confronting book about the mythology, the truths and lies of history. Dead Europe won the Age 2006 Book of the Year Award. Welcome, Christos. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have to admit to uh, a certain nerdishness in the way I approach this question. I think um, the question of inspiration and influence is so central to, to the work you do as a writer. But once you try to um, uh, make conscious sense of it, it becomes quite a difficult topic. So if, forgive me if I, I do approach it like I'm in the final year of high school and I've been set an essay topic. But what I wanted to do was examine the question of inspiration and the question of influence, and I think there is a, a subtle difference between the two. <clears throat> For many, many years now, I've been attending the Melbourne Film Festival, buying a season's pass, and for a fortnight, immersing myself in cinema from around the world. The reason I go back to the film festival year after year is because by the end of it, exhausted having seen three or four films a day, madly scribbling notes about the films in a Bruce journal at the bottom of my backpack, I come out into the Melbourne night elated, overwhelmed and excited by what I have seen and the worlds I have experienced. I should add here that it's not like I, I, I come out seeing dozens of films that I've loved. It doesn't matter to me. It, all I need is one or two or three films that make me uh, think of the world differently, uh, make me think of the possibility of, of what film and art can do. And to give you an example, last year I saw a Thai film called Syndromes and the Century, which was the same story told twice, once in a rural setting and once in an urban setting. It was this beautiful film that um, just in that subtle distinction told you a lot about what this new 20th century is about. And there is a phenomenon that occurs whenever you are confronted by the work of an artist who has challenged you, provoked you, astonished you, it demands of you to do better, to write better, to imagine better. I can only describe this feeling as libidinal and exultant, a transporting of self that is physical, emotional and intellectual. It is that moment after reading a book, a poem, watching a film, a play, contemplating a sculpture, a painting, where you are aware of the challenge of art. The impossible is possible. Of course, this is experienced most acutely when one is young, when one is first discovering the world and the self. It is that moment at 15 where I came out of a double bill of Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal and his cries and whispers and realised that there were possibilities and expressions available to me that were far more profound than the material I was reading and viewing at my suburban high school. A year later, I caught a double bill of Orson Welles' Citizen Kane and Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. I staggered out of the cinema and the world around me seemed monochromatic, listless and dull. Yet my mind was racing and my body felt electric. I had just experienced visions that were glorious, defiant and epic. Um, I walked over to the nearest rubbish bin and I proceeded to throw up. <laughs> the effect on me of these works was that visceral. The older you become, the more experienced, the more you read and the more you see. This visceral consuming response to art happens less and less. We all become critics, all of us do. And the result is that we are less susceptible to the shock of the new. We have seen it done before. We know, we know how these effects, those tricks are achieved. But this experience, this intoxication by art, is I think what keeps me going back, keeps me reading, keeps me exploring the possible worlds of imagination. Like a drug, it is a high I will forever be chasing. No matter how many dull books I have to sift through, no matter how many mechanical, heartless films I have to watch, how many derivative plays I have to attend. What am I looking for? A voice not heard before. An engagement with the most complex and difficult questions in contemporary culture. A narrative that takes you by surprise. 
When this happens, then that first high reoccurs. My, for myself, most recently in, in literature, this happened reading Omar Pamuk's Snow. And it need not only happen with new work. Over the last few years, I've discovered the mid 20th century Australian writer Randolph Stowe and discovered that something I wanted from Australian letters was already being explored more than a half century ago. I began with film because I'm cautious of a too neat distinction made in the arts where writers are put in this box, filmmakers in another, visual artists inhabit this box and playwright, playwrights are over there. I don't believe that this is true for inspiration and I don't believe it is necessarily true for how we work in the world. Seeing Brancusi sculpture Bird in Space in the Guggenheim in Venice made me begin to rethink my own writing practice, a questioning of how to create weightless, weightlessness and air with words. Being an adolescent at the moment of punk and post-punk music, succumbing to the aggressiveness, revolt and atonality of the music influenced the rhythms and tones and expression of what I wanted to write. What I wish to convey is how, for a writer, for any artist, inspiration is infinite possibility, arising from our sensations, our relationships, our being in the world and our engagement with the world. It is what we read, what we see, what we sense, what we overhear, who we work with, who we love, what we steal and what we borrow. So if your inspiration is openness and possibility, then what is influence? And I think it is in part direction. I say in part because it's very rare to have been influenced by work that does not also astonish, that does not inspire. But to indicate something of the difference, I want to point to, a great work, to great works of literature that I have read, and though the fluency of the language, the skill and the art of the writer might have moved me, the writing itself consists of a voice or a worldview and an expression that lay outside my capabilities, my talents or my interests. And I'm going to use the example of um, the writer Evelyn Waugh, the British writer. Um, um, Brideshead Revisited, I have re read and reread over the last 20 years and it remains for me a sublime pleasure every time I enter its world. But War's precise comic, comic dexterity is something I can love and respect, but which I cannot hope, nor do I have an interest in emulating. The rarefied intricacies and codes of class that permeate the European novel, from Oxbridge to across the channel in Paris, to Berlin, to Vienna, they are a world apart from myself. I can enjoy the writing, the detail, I can be inspired by the style and the voice, but attempting to emulate their writing and subject matter would be, be, would be to be led down a cul-de-sac. There is also, of course, writers of such unique ability who speak in the voice of genius, which means they are sui generi and impossible to follow. For example, for me in my life, such a voice is Kafka's and only failure results from attempting to be influenced by that voice. But writing always requires a leap of faith but to follow Kafka is folly. I think before such a writer, we are all merely readers. So what were the works that made me think I could write, that directed me towards investigating, learning and disciplining a craft? What were my influences? And I'm going to read you from uh, Norman Mailer, advertisements for myself. The Second World War presented a mirror to the human condition which blinded anyone who looked into it. For if tens of millions were killed in concentration camps out of the inexorable agonies and contractions of superstates founded upon the always, always insoluble contradictions of injustice, one was then obliged also to see that no matter how crippled and perverted an image of man was the society that he created, it was nonetheless his creation, his collective creation. And if society was so murderous, then who could ignore the most hideous of questions about his own nature? Worse. One could hardly maintain the courage to be individual, to speak with one's own voice, for the years in which one could complacently accept oneself as part of an elite by being a radical were forever gone. A man knew that when he dissented, he gave a note upon his life which could be called, up, called in any year of avert crisis. No wonder then that, th that these have been the years of conformity and depression. A stench of fear has come out of every pore of American life and we suffer from a collective failure of nerve. The only courage, with rare exception, that we, that we have been witness to has been the isolated courage of isolated people. I reread that during the Howard years and it made even more sense to me. 
I could have chosen to read a passage from Norman Mailer's An American Dream or The Naked and the Dead, both were works of fiction that splintered my adolescent world and forced me to view it as something more vital, more frightening, as possessing infinite possibility. But it would be playing memory false not to acknowledge how much of Mailer's non-fiction was equally devastating and powerful to read. This ability of mid 20th century American writers to engage with all aspects of culture, high, low, sports, jazz, sex, war, literature, cinema, to move freely between essay, fiction and polemic, contained a vigour and a vitality that spoke directly to me in a way that the Europeans could not. Alongside Mailer, I read Philip Roth, Henry Miller, Ralph Allison, James Aggie, Carson McCullers, Jack Kerouac, Eugene O'Neill, Philip K. Dick, Edward Albee, James Baldwin, Tennessee Williams, Nathaniel West, Hemingway and Faulkner, Pauline Kael and Mary McCarthy. Undeni undeniably, something I responded to in this writing had to do with the rawness of the language, the toughness of the voice that emerged from the novels, short stories, poems, essays and criticism I was reading. This was the writing I wanted to emulate, to follow. A writing whose straightforwardness and vividness made me want to pick up the pen. This toughness I was drawn to, inspired by, which influenced my own writing, was born of a national culture that was migrant, underdog, competitive, opportunistic, ugly, beautiful and vital. I was discovering an English not hostage to European rigidities of class and caste, a, a, an English language recreated anew. I don't think it's any, a, any accident either that two of the first writers I lionised and wanted to follow, Norman Mailer and Philip Roth, were children and grandchildren of poor emigrant Jews. The figure of the outsider, so much a product of post-war Western culture in the 20th century, nevertheless had much to say to me as a young man stuck out in Melbourne suburbia. In a matter of years, I was to discover that the Europeans too had their outsiders who spoke in a language of equivalent force and danger. Jean Genet, Céline, Nikos Kazantzakis, Albert Camus and Joseph Conrad. Now in saying this, I don't want to imply that my own identity and circumstances were any way equivalent to these writers. I was no prostitute thief, no fascist ex-soldier, not excommunicated, no Algerian pied noir, not a displaced Eastern European sailor. I was just a wog boy in the suburbs. But in the Thief's Journal, in Journey to the End of the Night, in The Outsider, Last Citation of Christ and Lord Jim, I was led to a map which pointed to ways of transforming experience into words which did not rely on safe regulations and sensorial prescriptions. I am going back to that first furious swoon when I fell in love with the potential of language because I believe that even though our tastes are mediated by experience and knowledge, that what we loved as a youth we may be embarrassed by or distanced from as an adult, this first love does direct the course of our future. I have come now to appreciate the nuanced, the considered, the delicate and fragile in writing, but I'm still most excited when the voice of the outsider, enraged, volatile, hopefully humane, but always insidiary, breaks through. The truth of one's influences only makes sense in retrospect in the ordering of memory. It was not until very recently, scanning a section of my bookshelves filled with some of my favourite books, that I realised that the metaphor and reality of the road has influenced the stories I want to tell. This immense Australian landscape, the call of space, marks us out as New World writers and offers another possible explanation to my attraction to the Americans. Kerouac's road, of course, comes to mind, but it is a road that stretches back to Twain's Huckleberry Finn, a road so devastatingly travelled most recently by the father and son in Cormac McCarthy's novel. The road trip is not only a new world metaphor. Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Kaczynski's The Painted Bird, The Thief's Journal Again and Pamuk's Snow are European manifestations of the theme. But all four occur either outside Europe or in landscapes with the cultural and social manifestations of a condition, of a condition called Europeanness have been torn apart. How can the road not influence our own writing as Australians? Don't we too have our own heart of darkness, a wretched schism between black and white that is not yet overcome? Are we not in part defined through the tyranny of distance? I had to travel to Europe again and again, had to expunge my own romance of that continent to come to a realisation that in that tyranny may also lie a liberation. Space, 
the immensity of the dreaming, other forms of imagining, carried in waves here by transportation, by immigration, by exile. It is only with hindsight that I realise that my reading, my influences have been leading me down a road all along that is a turning away from British Europe, from Irish Europe, from Greek Europe, from French or Italian or German or Polish or Russian Europe. I am interested in the directions we can offer, the maps we can make. I have the prostitute thief, the displaced emigre. I have the Americans to, thanks, to thank for pointing me in that direction. Thank you. Thank you.